My name is Norwin Marins. I'm working on behalf of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs nationally and uh, through its Midwest region. And we're pleased to have this morning a uh, very distinguished you know why uh, that water bottle. Is very, uh, if we could ask everyone. And it was just sitting do you want to wash it? Yeah, why don't we wash it? Okay, you it out and wash left it. Full of water. Yeah, no, okay, if we could ask everyone to mute themselves so we don't have to get any I Love Lucy playback. Uh, except our speaker. <clears throat> so it's uh, with uh, considerable pleasure and, and an honor that I'm introducing Bob uh, Levy, who has an, a longstanding journalistic background. Uh, his college diploma says that he majored in journalism, but he uh, actually majored in, as he writes, uh, editing the student newspaper. He took over as editor in chief of the uh, paper on November 22nd, 1963. So most everyone on, on this call probably has some recall of what happened on that Friday in November of 1963. Uh, back then he did everything from paste up of uh, newspaper layout to tossing bundles of papers on front stoops and it qualified him in his mind his estimation for his first professional job, which was as a cub reporter for the Albuquerque Tribune in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, he spent 13 months there and he moved on to Washington, DC in uh, September of 1967 and uh, made an inquiry through the Washington Post and was the first reporter hired by the esteemed uh, Washington Post editor, Ben Bradley. Um, in his first 14 years working on the staff at the, at the post, he, uh, in this order, worked as night police reporter, day police reporter, roving national political reporter, assistant city editor, courts reporter, district building reporter, Capitol Hill reporter, feature writer, assistant sports editor, and again as feature writer. And in June of 1981, he was asked to write a daily column for the post. Uh, figuring he did, he'd tried just about everything else, he signed up and said, I will pursue it, and he did. And some 3,000 columns later, uh, the success is there. Uh, Bob was born in Manhattan and grew up in the Bronx. Uh, and uh, at the uh, time that he went away to college, he attended and graduated from the University of Chicago where his undergraduate degree was in English literature. He's worked for seven local radio stations, four local TV stations as a commentator and talk show host, and he's taught journalism at three local universities. Uh, he's a life master and regional champion at Tournament Bridge and still plays competitive slow pitch uh, softball. Uh, he's married to a historian and a recovering journalist. Uh, Wife's name is Jane. They have two children, both of whom profess to be bored by newspapers, but he concedes there's still time. Uh, more specifically <laughs> with regard to his involvement with the Post, uh, he sat between Woodward and Bernstein throughout the Watergate hearings. And he uh, uh, told me that it's uh, next June, June 17th is the 50th anniversary of the uh, uh, famed uh, Watergate uh, break-in uh, in the uh, complex in D.C. Uh, he's recently uh, produced his first novel entitled Larry Felder, Candidate. Uh, the story is of a Washington journalist who gave up his career to run for Congress uh, in the Washington uh, suburbs. The book is, for avail is available for sale, and uh, Bob will get into those those details and the uh, uh, crux of the, uh, the novel uh, during his presentation this morning. We ask that everyone mute. Uh, if they want to send uh, questions through the chat, that's perfectly fine. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Bob Levy and uh, I'm looking forward to a great uh, exchange uh, this morning. Bob? Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I only wish we could do it in the flesh, but uh, maybe one of these years we can. 
Mr. Marins, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm happy to update a couple of things there. Uh, uh, it was more than 3,000 columns. It was exactly 5,411 columns done on deadline every day. And somehow I am still drawing breath. And I'm delighted too to uh, say that since I wrote that bio, I have become a national champion at Bridge, proving yet again that I have a great ability to spend my time on stuff that makes me absolutely no money whatsoever. <laughs> Journalism is like that too. I'm going to be talking today about the golden era at the Washington Post, which I was so lucky to have been a part of. And Mr. Marins has sketched some of that. Uh, I was the first reporter hired by Ben Bradley. I sat right between Woodward and Bernstein during Watergate. I had a many decades first name basis friendship with the amazing publisher of the Post, Catherine Graham. But none of it ever would have happened if I were not also the luckiest duck who ever quacked. And we can all share uh, job interview stories probably, but I would stack mine up against anybody's and here's the way it went. There I was in Albuquerque, as Mr. Marin said, and uh, I was all of 22 years old and I had spent a little over a year there and I thought I was ready for the big time and wrote a letter to the editor of the Washington Post. You remember letters with a stamp up in the corner? <laughs> and I said I wanted to come east for an interview and he wrote back a letter with a stamp and we made a date for a Monday morning at 9 a.m. Well, the previous Friday comes around, it's time to fly, and I'm driving around and around and around the parking lot at the Albuquerque airport. I cannot find a place to park anywhere. Oh my gosh, my future is going up in smoke. What am I, finally I get a place to park. I'm running through the airport. I have 10 minutes to make this flight. And it occurs to me that I have nothing to read before five hours up in the sky. So I dip into the bookstore in the Albuquerque airport and I buy a book about bridge, of course, called Better Bidding in 30 Days. You know, one of those books that they sell only in airports, apparently. I read the book all the way east, uh, had a good weekend in Washington. I show up right on time for my uh, interview with the guy I thought I was seeing, and this young woman comes down to get me and says, oh, didn't they tell you? He's not the editor of the Washington Post anymore. Really? Yeah, really, because over the weekend, President Johnson has named him the ambassador to the United Nations. <laughs> and there's a new guy in the corner office who does not know me, and I don't know him, and I stick out my hand and say hi, and he says, hi. I'm Ben Bradley. Well, on, only six years from that moment, he will become the most famous newspaper editor in American history. And this was the first minute of his first day in the big job. And uh, we go into his office. And if you gentlemen have seen All the President's Men, the famous movie about Watergate, Jason Robards Jr. just absolutely nails Bradley in that movie. I've never seen a better performance. Bradley was two people conjoined into one. He was either your best friend, hail fellow, well met, or he was all business. So I get the first Bradley, we're sitting there, how was your trip, la da 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 da. And then he just flicks it on. And he did talk like this, by the way. He looked at me and he said, all right, what's the last book you read? Uh-oh. Obviously, Bradley wanted me to say David Copperfield or something like that. And I remember thinking, well, Robert, you had a nice weekend in Washington. And I decided to tell him the truth. I do not know why to this day. But I looked at him and I said, better bidding in 30 days, Mr. Bradley. And he said, you play bridge? I said, yes, I do. You play well? And I said, well, I got hundreds of master points and blah, blah. Bradley starts writing on a yellow pad, and I can't see what he's writing. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be a message to his secretary. It's going to say, get this kid out of here right now. But no, he finishes and he frisbees the pad at me, hits me in the chest. I look at the pad. There's a bridge hand written on the pad. And Bradley explains that he was playing with his wife last night. This is her hand. He opened the bidding with one club. 
And do you believe she bid one diamond with that hand? And here with my entire future hanging in the balance, I too would have bid one diamond with that hand. And I said, oh no, sir, one heart is a much better bid. And then I get 10 minutes of Bradley reminiscing about how he used to fleece the suckers in the dorm at Harvard in the 10 cent a point bridge game. <laughs> I think he thought I was fast Eddie or somebody, which I was not and am not. But finally he stood up and shook, stuck out his hand and said, you're hired. And that began a 36 year adventure for me at the Washington Post, where I've uh, name dropped the people I got to know so well over those years, but not all of them. Really in those days, and to some extent these days, uh, the Post was known as a political reporter's newspaper. And uh, some of the guys who became my mentors and my friends at the Post, uh, uh, they had reputations that I'm sure will, will, will resonate with a lot of you. David Broder, who was the chief political correspondent for many years. Haynes Johnson, the four time Pulitzer Prize winner. Bill Greider, who often wrote the front page political wrap up stories. Uh, these guys were my friends and my wailing wall and my mentors. And they really made the post as what it was as much as the names I've already mentioned. So a couple of years ago, I was thinking about writing uh, about those days and a memoir about the post. And I started it and it wasn't going so great. And, other people had done memoirs and had done them very well. And so what I decided to do instead was a novel about the newspaper industry and about congressional politics, uh, both of which are loves of mine. And here, gentlemen, is the result. My book, Larry Felder Candidate, is the title. It's the story of a famous newspaper columnist who abandons journalism to run for Congress in the suburbs of Washington, DC. <laughs> All kinds of stuff happens to poor Larry. Love happens, corruption happens, those nasty newspaper reporters get in his way and the unexpected happens, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but the good guys do win in the end. And Although this book is fiction, everything in it could have happened. And uh, uh, I just uh, imagined it uh, with a reality in mind. So if you're a fan of uh, the newspaper industry, you want to know what really happens in the sausage factory, and you are interested in what happens within a congressional campaign, this is the book for you. And as you saw in the promo for my presentation today, the book is available through my sales website if you're interested. It's boblevypublishing.com, boblevypublishing.com. And uh, the good news is that I live right next to a post office and your copy will be on its way to you whenever you, as soon as, uh, as, soon as you buy it. All of those years at the Post uh, really fed into this book. Uh, in the book, you will meet characters who truly do exist in Washington, D.C. In addition to Larry, who, like me, grew up in the Bronx, you will meet one of Larry's boyhood buddies from the Bronx, who has <clears throat> grown up to be <clears throat> one of those lawyers that Washington is famous for with a picture window view out over Lafayette Square in the White House. And this guy is quite the power player in Washington, but he agrees to be Larry's informal chief of staff. Then there is Larry's actual chief of staff, a much younger woman whose nickname is Charlie. And Charlie is Larry's girl Friday. Charlie would also like to be Larry's girl Monday, girl Tuesday, you get the point. But uh, the two of them clash throughout the book. It's not the simplest relationship. You will meet the editor of the newspaper that I so cleverly disguised by calling it the Washington Record, Callaway Cassidy III, based only a little bit on Ben Bradley and this guy thinks he's the roughest, toughest dude in the forest, but he's really a pretty sweet, uh, mild-mannered guy underneath it all. And you will meet uh, the woman who was assigned to the Larry Felder campaign. She's one of these newspaper reporters 
who eats broken glass for breakfast. And uh, she and Larry collide during the campaign all the time. I'm delighted to say that one of the readers of the book was none other than Congressman Jamie Raskin, whom a lot of you have come to know over the last couple of years. Raskin is in his third term representing the 8th District of Maryland, right outside of Washington, where I happen to live. And uh, you've seen Raskin all over TV in the last year because he managed the impeachment of Donald Trump. And he uh, went back to do his job there uh, just days after his son committed suicide. And in the current issue of The New Yorker, for those of you who read it, is a remarkable essay about why Jamie Raskin should be the man of the year and, he, and, and why he is. Here's what Jamie Raskin said about Larry Felder candidate. He said, I'm only glad I never had to run against either Larry Felder or Bob Levy. <laughs> I was very grateful for that. Uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, I am not running for Congress or anything else. Uh, I ran for the student council in the sixth grade and I lost. And I was so brokenhearted after that that I've never run for anything again. And I'm never giving up journalism. It's just too much in my blood and in my being. But uh, I think the story really does attract a lot of attention in the good ways. I've had lots of nice notices. I'm happy to tell you more about the book later on if you're interested. Watergate landed on the Washington Post in a way that made its reputation. And the two guys who were the key reporters in the Watergate story, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, stand tall today, even now, even nearly 50 years later, as two of the greatest reporters who ever lived. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein could not be more different people. Bob was uh, raised on the North Shore of Chicago. His father was a Republican judge. Bob spent most of his childhood at a country club. Bob famously never met an African-American until he was 15 years old. Bob was bred to be what his father was, a Yale graduate, a, a Navy officer, a Harvard Law School graduate, and he was gonna be a dupe of his father. Well, Bob did the Yale piece and the Navy piece, and then he said to his father, you know, this is not what I want. I want to be an investigative reporter. And his father memorably said, you're crazy. You'll never make a living at that. <laughs> well, Woodward may be the only rich journalist I have ever met. He has now done 21 best-selling books. He's almost 80 years old. The guy works harder and better than any reporter I have ever seen. Even at this age, even when he has really nothing left to prove, Bob locks himself in his study every day for nine hours, starting at 9 a.m. sharp, and he works all the way until 6 p.m. sharp. He's never going to get enough, and neither are we. Uh, the guy is a machine. He's a great reporter. He's a loyal friend. He's really a, a tough uh, honest person, uh, and he's never, to my knowledge, made a mistake or a willful mistake. Carl Bernstein, on the other hand, was the son of two members of the Communist Party. He grew up in the suburbs of Washington. He went to a public high school with the likes of Goldie Hawn and Ben Stein. Carl was not the most diligent student who ever lived, to put it mildly, and uh, he almost flunked out of high school, which takes some doing. He got to the post at a very young age and uh, he, I have to say, did his best to squander that opportunity. There are two remarkable stories about Carl that, uh, that uh, I think uh, prove that he's got, uh, he's got that lucky gene. Carl never met a woman he didn't try to chase and he never met a freebie he didn't try to take advantage of. Carl used to go to embassy parties here in Washington, just walk in uninvited and say, hi there, I'm Carl Bernstein from the Washington Post. And the staff would say, oh, right this way, sir. Would you like something to eat? Would you like something to drink right this way? And Carl would immediately consume a plate of free food and a glass of free something or other. 
And then he would say to his hosts, gee, you know, I forgot. I've got a tough deadline. I got to get right back to the office. He'd go right back to the office, didn't pay a nickel. Carl uh, really did uh, manage to live at both ends of the uh, candle, as they say. And uh, one day when he was a young reporter before Watergate, Bradley came down to the city hall in Washington to meet with the mayor. It's, it's lunchtime. And he's decided that he would pop into the press room before he went to see the mayor just to say hello to Bernstein. So he walks in at something like 1230 in the afternoon and Bernstein is crashed out on the couch asleep, sleeping off the night before, which may well have extended into that morning, knowing Carl, uh, he really, uh, he loved to live that way. Well, he wasn't fired for that, uh, nor was he fired for the next thing that he managed to do. I still laugh about this. I'll tell you why in a minute. Carl went out of town on an assignment to Cleveland uh, and he filed his story and came back and no one ever thought much about uh, looking back at the Cleveland stuff because life roars on at a newspaper. It's always about tomorrow. One month later, the manager of the Hertz Rent-A-Car office at the Cleveland airport calls Bradley. Is Mr. Bernstein planning to return the car that he rented one <laughs> month ago? <laughs> the meter's been running for one month on this car and Carl, quote, forgot to return the car. Well, any of you who've ever been in the United States Navy can check me on this, but Bradley was always proud of this. Bradley served in the Navy with a young lieutenant named John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and the two of them became lifelong friends. Bradley always said that the major benefit of his Navy service was that he learned how to curse nonstop for two minutes without repeating himself. Try it sometime, guys. Uh, you will flame out after 20 seconds, I promise. Bradley comes out of his office and gives Bernstein the entire two minutes in front of the whole newsroom. It might actually have been two minutes and 20 seconds. And only because friends of Carl's on the staff interceded with Bradley and said, don't fire him, don't do it, don't fire him. He was allowed to continue. And three weeks later, the Watergate break-in happened. And Carl now belongs to the ages. My one regret over 36 years on the full-time staff of the Post is that I am not in all the president's men. I should be, I could be, I could have been, I could have been a contender. Here's why. As I heard you, as I said before, I sat right between Bob and Carl during uh, the two years that Watergate was the story in the world. And every afternoon at about 5.30, as the first edition deadline was bearing down on us, <clears throat> squadrons of editors would come over to our little part of the newsroom. And I'm sitting in between them, not writing about Watergate. And they would hunch over us. Uh, what do you got today, Woodward? What did Nixon say? What did John Mitchell say? They're hover, hover, hover. So here is the one line that surely, gentlemen, would have won me best supporting actor and should have. I delivered this line every day. I would turn a half turn to my right and say, would you guys please go somewhere else? I'm trying to get some work done here. They never went somewhere else. The good news is, uh, as we've said, that the Watergate break-in is about to be 50 years old. And some people in Hollywood are considering a remake of All the President's Men. So I may get another chance. Wouldn't that be nice? I'll either be me uh, uttering that line, or I'm thinking Brad Pitt would play me. Uh, either way, somebody's got to win Best Supporting Actor for that one line. Woodward and Bernstein made the Post's reputation, but really nobody made it more and kept it alive more than the remarkable publisher of the paper, Catherine Graham. For those of you who don't know the full story, her father, Eugene Meyer, bought the Washington Post at auction in 1933. He was a financier from Wall Street who had come to Washington to work in the uh, FDR administration. And he bought this uh, newspaper for a song. It was, uh, as the saying goes, 
the fifth newspaper in a four newspaper town. <laughs> and uh, instead of giving it to his daughter, Catherine Graham, to run, he gave it to her young husband because that's the way life was done those days. His name was Philip L. Graham, a uh, young graduate of uh, Harvard Law School who uh, became a, a great publisher of the Washington Post. He built it into uh, the most successful morning paper in the city. He bought and, and, and incubated Newsweek magazine, uh, went into television and radio, started other uh, magazines. Catherine Graham, meantime, had no idea that she would ever become who she became, no desire, really. <clears throat> she went home and had one, two, three, four children right in a row. She did dinner parties for her husband. She was on all the nonprofit boards. She never saw herself as an executive. And one day in 1963, Phil Graham committed suicide. And Catherine Graham, as you may have seen in the more recent movie about the Post called The Post, was faced with a major decision. <clears throat> Excuse me. Was she going to run the newspaper? Was she going to sell the newspaper? Was she going to run the newspaper with help? And a lot of people said, oh, you know, you're a woman. You don't get this. You just you can't do this. She decided in her late 40s that she would do it. And I think you know the rest, gentlemen. Uh, she was surely the most famous female publisher who ever lived, perhaps the most famous and successful publisher of any gender who ever lived. And people used to say she was among the most powerful women in the world. She hated that. You know, she would say, what about Golda Meir and what about Margaret Thatcher? But uh, really, when it came to everyday power to change the conversation, her newspaper did that pretty well. Catherine Graham was one of the most complicated people I have ever known because she too could be two people. She could either be your best buddy or she could be your, your scold, but she was loyal to her people in ways that I'd still make my head shake. Here's one example. Uh, in about the early 90s, I think it was, uh, in my column in the Post, uh, I was doing uh, a campaign where <clears throat> the big local grocery chain, Giant Food, <clears throat> excuse me, was offering a deal where you could bundle your grocery receipts and redeem them for uh, computer equipment at your kid's school. And Mr. Wonderful here, Mr. Genius with his a million readers a day said, what if I ask my readers to send me all of their receipts and then we can bundle hundreds of receipts and maybe we get a full computer lab for some school in a bad part of town that would otherwise not get them. And so I did this for several years and it was a measure of where the post was uh, 30 some years ago that uh, one of those years I collected $20 million worth of receipts from Giant Food. Wow. We built a computer lab in this school and that school. Things were going well and I was about ready to start it again. One day my phone rings and it's a guy I don't know who introduces himself as some kind of new vice president at Giant Food. And this guy starts screaming at me. Bob Levy, you have to stop doing this right now. Bob Levy, don't you know that the whole point of this campaign is that no one will ever redeem these receipts? Bob Levy, don't you know we spend $18 million a year in advertising in your newspaper? Bob Levy, do you want me to call Catherine Graham? Blah, 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 blah. Well, I don't know who hung up on whom first. It was probably a dead heat. But I remember thinking, Robert, you're in trouble here. Well, five minutes later, the phone rings and it's a woman with a very deep voice that I recognize right away. Bob, she said, what's this about giant food? So I told Catherine Graham the whole story and she said, Bob, I'll take care of it. I never heard another word. This woman, my publisher, went to the mat with an $18 million a year advertiser on behalf of one guy who had one column and one idea about how he should do things in print. 
man, oh man, what a gift she was and what a, what a backbone she had. You know, she used to say, I will build the sandbox and all of you guys get to play. And indeed we did play and I thank her for that. But she had a human side too, which a lot of the public never saw because she was such a tough businesswoman. In 1997, I uh, had to have heart surgery suddenly and I was out of work for six weeks. And I think you guys now have seen enough of me in these half hours or so to know that I'm a very energetic type A kind of guy. And uh, that was hard to sit at home for six weeks, but I did it. And finally the Monday morning came around when I could go back to work and I knew there'd be a ton of stuff waiting for me mail and phone messages and all that. So I got to work that morning at six o'clock in the morning, figuring I'd get a running jump on the day. I'm at work and nobody's there at six o'clock in the morning. Nobody ever. Even the cleaning crews have gone home. So I'm doing my thing. I'm working at my desk, click, click, open, jump, blum, blum. I became aware of somebody behind me and I turn around. It's 6.15 a.m. And it's Catherine Graham. Just wanted to see how you're doing, she said. Wow. I hope we've all had bosses like that. I know that I did. I know that I was lucky to have her. I know that without her, the post would never have been what it was. So many people concentrate on the editorial side without recognizing the role that the business side plays and has to play. And she is the person who made it all go. My time at the Post came to an end rather abruptly at the end of 2003. There'd been rumors that the Post was beginning to fail and uh, indeed that uh, was close to correct. The Post never really got its arms around the internet in the early days. And obviously the, uh, the collision between technology and the old fashioned way of doing journalism has left journalism in shreds in many cities. Uh, and the, the, the toll is not finished yet. Uh, 1,600 newspapers have gone out of business in the United States in the last 20 years. More than half the people who worked for a newspaper 20 years ago do not work for one today. The newspaper has become almost entirely gone. It's a digital product now. And one of the problems at the Post was that no one in the executive suite really saw this coming or prepared for it. So the Post was in real trouble at the end of 2003, and they decided to buy out 154 of their senior people at the same time, and I was one of them. This just could not have come at a worse time in our lives. Uh, we had one in college, we had another one about to go to college, uh, and suddenly Mr. Uh, Atlas here, who'd been holding this whole thing up, was not going to have an income anymore. So I decided to go do something else with my life. And the good news is that in the years since, I have stayed connected to journalism. But I've also run a nonprofit uh, cor corporation and uh, had the three teaching positions at universities. And I was a senior executive in a big hospital here in Washington. So uh, I haven't missed any meals. But the main thing was I was sure I was done with journalism, sure I was done with the Washington Post. Three weeks after I had left, my phone rings, <laughs> and it's the obituary editor at the Post. He's a guy I knew, and I said, hi, how you doing? Thanks for calling, but why are you calling? I, I, I haven't been looking so good lately. And he said, no, 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 nothing like that. He said the night before, this is in 2004, gives you an idea of how long ago this was. They'd been sitting around the office and suddenly the word came down that Jimmy Carter, a former president, had been hospitalized in Georgia. And they looked in the file and discovered they had nothing prepared to go on Jimmy Carter. Oh my gosh. If a former president died on deadline and they had to scramble something together, what an embarrassment that would be. So he said to me, we found some money. We wanna hire you and a couple of other fossils to do advanced obits on famous people. 
not just politicians, <clears throat> but also entertainers, media people, sports figures, famous people. And would I be interested in doing that? So I said, yeah, sure. I've been doing it ever since, gentlemen. I've done about 44 of these, I think it is. And uh, for many, many years, this was really strange. Uh, these obits sit in the can until that awful day when they pull it up and out and put a cause of death up top and they put the survivors down at the bottom and they have an obit ready to go. I had a remarkable streak in there for more than seven years. None of mine died. <laughs> My daughter wanted me to print up new business cards that said, if you want to live forever, have Levy do your obituary. <laughs> and then finally, it changed. Just three months ago, two of mine died in the same week. <clears throat> One of them was uh, the famous star of the Today Show, Willard Scott. And that obit had been sitting in the can for more than 12 years. Just gives you an idea how strange this can be. Here's another way it's strange. Uh, before the pandemic, I was still doing a lot of public appearances around uh, Washington and around the country. And a lot of them were black tie events at night. And I would walk into the ballroom of some hotel and across the room, I would see a politician, let's say famous guy. I had done his obituary years earlier. I knew that, but he didn't know that. So I would always walk up to this person, let's say he's a governor and stick out my hand and say, how you doing governor? And the governor would say, good to see you, Bob. And I'd say, I just pause a beat, my little private joke. And I'd look at him and I'd say, you doing okay? <laughs> I never admitted why I asked him that question. I am not allowed to tell you whose obits I have done. I am not allowed to ask to do anybody. I am not allowed to do myself. I have not done Donald Trump. I have not done Hillary Clinton. Uh, I have done a lot of people you've heard of. Uh, and I just want to give you one story here that gives you an idea, I think, of <clears throat> how conflict happens inside a newspaper. I know I just said that uh, I'm not allowed to tell you who I've done, but I'm gonna break that promise because this story will make no sense without this. A couple of months ago, they gave me Tom Jones, who was a very famous singer about 50 years ago, still is. Maybe some of you go back that far. He was a very big deal on television in Las Vegas in the 70s, you remember. It's not unusual, that guy. Well, I didn't know Tom Jones uh, and I started the way any of you would I listened to about three hours of his music. And in giving me the assignment to do Tom Jones, the obit editor had said this. He'd said, you know, Bob, you're doing a great job with these obits, but we want you to take more chances as a writer. You know, let your belt out, a swing from the heels. He actually said that. Swing from the heels, write the heck out of these. And I said, hey, great. You know, any writer wants to hear that. So I'm listening to Tom Jones's music and I came to the conclusion that this guy can not sing, really. I hope I'm not offending anybody out there. <laughs> Any of you are fans of his. I'm the father of two professional singers and uh, they have taught me what bad singing is, mostly because that's how I sing. Tom Jones does what's called scooping. Instead of singing right at the note, he dredges his voice up to the note. For example, he made a zillion dollars on a song called The Green Green Grass of Home, which some of you may know. Joan Baez did this song. Charlie Pride did this song. Johnny Cash did this song. Porter Wagner did this song. They all did the song the right way. And, and when Jones did the song, he did it like this. The old hometown looks the same. Step down. So bearing in mind that the guy said swing from the heels, I actually did write the following paragraph. Tom Jones was one of three men in the 20th century who had highly successful careers as singers without 
being able to sing, period. The other two were Rex Harrison and Willie Nelson, period. And I pushed send. Now, if I was with you guys in person, uh, we would now go around the room and play The Price is Right, and I would ask you to guess, without going over, how many minutes it took for the editor to call me at home. Well, I'll save you the trouble. The answer was five minutes, which for him was fast. Bob, we can't say this. What do you mean we can't say this? You said write the heck out of it. You said, Bob, we can't say this. So we are fighting with each other about that. And uh, guess who won, gang? I think you guessed. So Tom Jones is still cooking in his native Wales. He's there with his uh, umpty umpt wife and he sits around making comeback tour records and uh, counting his money. And as a public service gentleman today, I have now told you the one paragraph you will not read in the Washington Post the day he dies. With that, I think I'm gonna stop and uh, open the floor for questions. But before I do, thank you very much for being here this morning. It's really a pleasure to talk with you and to you. Uh, again, I wanna remind you that the book is available. Sign copies if you like, uh, and I'll be happy to get the copies out to you right away. BobLevyPublishing.com. Happy to answer any questions of any kind from anybody. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, we're going to open the uh, floor, or the uh, Zoom uh, profiles up to uh, to questions. Let's see if we have anything on the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can unzoom yourself. Uh, I think you mean unmute. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. Yeah, so yeah, I had jotted down a few things. First, uh, uh, Bob, I, I thought your presentation was really excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, and uh, I really enjoy your speaking voice. The first question I had was, are you still doing radio? <laughs> I am not still doing radio. The bad news is, and, and you will sympathize with this, uh, the minute your brown hair turns to uh, this ugly white, they don't want you anymore. They Same really want is fine, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the answer is no, and uh, the answer also is full of regret. I would love to do it. No, I don't. But I still am uh, uh, beginning to move into the podcast world, and I do uh, commercials. I do voiceovers, uh, even though really the same story. They don't want voices like mine anymore. They don't want the so-called voice of God. What they want is what my daughter, who's an actor and a singer, can do. My daughter had a national commercial for Verizon on television. And uh, they didn't want somebody who sounded sonorous like me. They wanted her. And so here she is on Verizon saying, ooh, I like, love my Verizon-like plan. It's like the greatest like. You see what I'm saying? I couldn't talk like that if my life depends on it. And uh, the good news is that she doesn't do that really either. She's an actor and can put it on. But short answer, no, no more radio. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate your, your answer on that. So uh, the, the main question I had during your talk was, obviously, uh, Woodward and Bernstein got so much uh, on the Watergate incident. But I believe that uh, the Pentagon Papers incident preceded that. Were you involved in any of the work on the Pentagon Papers in the post? No, I was not, although I was there at that time, and you're, you're absolutely right. The Pentagon Papers crested a little, a little less than a year before the Watergate break. Yeah. The New York Times and the Washington Post and the Boston Globe decided to publish this national security trove, even though the the national government insisted that they should not and could not and the case went to the supreme court which found for the papers yeah it was a really gutsy uh, move on the really gutsy publisher. yeah you know and, and Catherine graham uh, bet the entire ranch on that one uh, story yeah remember this uh, gentleman and i see a lady there ladies and gentlemen uh 
when you run a lot of radio and television stations in the United States, you need to be licensed by the Federal Communications Commission. <clears throat> and Catherine Graham had been threatened directly by the Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, with cancellation of her licenses. Now, she was making a million, million, million dollar bet on this story. And uh, you know which way it went. Uh, just a general comment that, that perhaps you could uh, respond to. So uh, I think we're all aware of how poorly papers are doing in general in the last 10, 20 years. But I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, and the two issues are probably highly related, is that uh, papers here in Chicago, I mean, in particular, the Chicago Tribune, for example, seem so poorly written these days compared to how they used to be written. Yeah. Uh, it, it's almost, uh, you know, it, it, it makes one reconsider reading those papers. Well, a lot of people have reconsidered and will continue to reconsider. And what you are seeing is the wages of sin here. You're seeing the results of staff cuts. It's not that the trib is poorly written so much as it's that the, poor, the, the trib is not as edited as well as it used to be, because there are many fewer editors who are uh, being asked to do three times as much work, each of them as they used to do. And so errors creep in and sloppiness creeps in. How to, how to cure this? I have no idea. I don't think print is the future. I don't think it uh, will be even with us 10 years from now at all. Uh, I think everything is going to be digital. It almost now is. And uh, it'll be a, a sad day for all of us who grew up with that, uh, with the paper route. Yeah, maybe some of you guys did that, uh, begging dollars at the door from Mrs. Smith. <laughs> who would always say, well, I don't have the change right now. Why don't you come back in two days? And she would never pay you ever. Uh, that's how newspapers used to run. I do think that papers like the Post, though, may keep alive a print edition for a while, uh, just because uh, not everybody gets old uh, and disappears at the same rate. Uh, it, it is still a product that people want and still depend on. You know, guys, I have never heard this expression. It's a Sunday morning, and I'm just going to sit down with my second cup of coffee and pick up my laptop. I have never heard that sentence. I have heard the sentence that ends with my New York Times, my Chicago Tribune. Uh, so we'll just have to see if the marketplace will allow something like print in the future, but all the signs are very, very bad. Okay, we had a, uh, Darwin? Yes. I, I have, a, I don't have a, I have a comment to make, but not a question. And the comment is, I heard on the radio many years ago at the Watergate time, I believe it was Arthur Miller lived in the complex, and he said, that they didn't have to break into the office. All they had to do was put their ears to the wall. They were so so thin. <laughs> well, that was true. That was not the best uh, made office building in the history of office buildings. However, they did break in. <clears throat> and uh, you remember the story, the piece of tape on the door jam and this young rent cop who was only 20 years old, just come to Washington said, this is awfully strange. And he went in there with a flashlight and there were these five burglars dressed in suits. <laughs> there were many ridiculous parts of this story, but come on, Mr. Minkoff, if you were gonna burglarize a building, would you wear a suit? Really? You really would? These five only guys did. Bob, only if I was high class. <laughs> well, I'll leave it to you to decide whether they were high class or low class. <laughs> but I will say this, when the five of them were arrested and brought down to police headquarters in Washington in the robbery squad, which generally dealt with purse snatchers and uh, other low life. The cops didn't know what to make of these guys. And the real piece of the Watergate story that almost never gets told, I'm now going to tell. <clears throat> One of my oldest friends in journalism was the night police reporter at the Post. And he was friends with all the cops. And he was working the night those five burglars were brought in. 
And one of the cops took the address book out of the jacket of one of the burglars and he started riffling through it. And he saw there, you know, it was one of those address books. Bring it downstairs. Tabs for each, uh, each letter of the alphabet. And he got to the W's. And there in the W's of this guy's address book, it said WH456. 1414. And that was strange because that was the phone number, and it still is the phone number for the White House. How very unusual that a burglar in a suit would have an address book with the phone number of the White House. And thus began the entire Watergate adventure. And by the way, that reporter is never canonized the way Woodward and Bernstein have been. And I think in many ways, uh, he's uh, just, as, just as responsible for the success of that story at the Post as they are. Norm, can I suggest that you uh, go to Jerry Salzberg, oh, God, a colleague? He's been waiting for you. Yes, time. yes. Uh, Jerry Salzberg and Elizabeth. Uh... Hi, I want to make a comment. Uh, first of all, I watched every bit of Watergate back then almost I, I don't think I missed an hour it was like drama unfolding by the hour it was amazing John Dean John Mitchell all the characters so I, I'm a big fan of Watergate <laughs> um, I remember the Brooklyn Eagle I, I grew up in Brooklyn that I don't know if anybody remembers the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper I remember it <laughs> but I, I do want to say something I'm a, I'm a professional singer and a voice teacher of, of been, I'm an internationally known voice teacher I have to say, and I'm a classical singer uh, first, uh, Juilliard master's bachelor. So I just wanna give myself some credibility before I tell you that my opinion of Tom Jones is that he's an amazing singer. To really? come up with it, yes, to come up, he's got a great voice, his, his basic instrument is amazing. But to come up with a style that, that has lasted all these years is, is a feat that, Singers only wish they could come up with their own unique style. Um, another one is Tom Petty. Another one is Bob Dylan, so-called non-singers. I've heard Bob Dylan really sing. He used to sing in this uh, choir in high school. These people come up with a sound that is kind of pedestrian, that is um, what would be Bette Midler is another one. She has a better voice than what she sings with. Um, the, I mean, if you want to call good singers, go to go to the opera, the Met, you know, or, or music theater. Um, that's the standard of really good singing, good support, <laughs> beautiful tone. That's not what he's about. Mm -hmm. And Welsh people are known for their great voices. So the fact that he kind of came up with what you call scooping, and in classical, that's a no-no. Yeah. That would be that would. Oh no, you would never <laughs> scoop it. We call it. Um, uh, we call it something, uh, oh, I can't think of it now, uh, but it's a slide, but it's done in, in Puccini, in, not in Mozart, but it, you know, within classical, you have different styles, Mozart to Puccini to Verdi to Strauss to Wagner, all different. Same thing with pop. He, he, in my opinion, I give him a lot of credit for coming up with a style that's lasted all these years. So that's my opinion. Well, um, point, <laughs> point taken and Maybe what I should have said, and maybe what I will no, say what now, do? is that no, I can't get an interpretation of these songs what did you do? Uh, that, uh, I, I, that he's painted I, onto his career, yeah, trying to make a rather than it being a natural I'm part of his voice. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, Bob, we had a couple of questions from Jonathan Epstein, who's a professional journalist in uh, Buffalo, New York. What did you do? And okay. uh, I'm going to make it louder at the bottom. I pressed something. That's not good at all. Okay. If, uh, if, if others could zoom themselves or uh, mute themselves, it would be appreciated. Yeah, like Norman Ring, okay? Put, mute yourself. Uh, the question is, what are some of your favorite stories that you've worked on? And what are, what is your, your, what are your thoughts on involvement of Wall Street in journalism and newspaper consolidation? Well, let's do the first one first. Uh, more and more, Wall Street is not directly involved in newspapers because more and more family-owned newspapers do not sell stock. The Washington Post was sold on the open market <laughs> until the Graham sold it in 2013. 
The New York Times is one of the last holdout family owned newspapers that sell stock. Chains sell stock and chains are buying up more and more newspapers. But even there, they are not so much dependent on Wall Street uh, financing. Uh, they, they have gone into uh, the real estate business. Uh, many of them have bought newspapers only to uh, starve them, really, and to Should buy I up their uh, real estate. Please so uh, Wall Street does not have the influence that it had 30 and 50 and years ago. Here, here, and Some of the greatest stories I've worked on, oh my you're, gosh, the, you're, the you're, list you're goes not on, and anymore. on and on. I, I covered the George, the George Wallace presidential campaign in 1968. I uh, covered the uh, National Basketball Association finals in 1974. I covered uh, the, uh, let me see, what am I leaving out here? I covered the aftermath of Martin Luther King's assassination. And I was uh, at work bright and early on a morning in September of 2001 when some guy came running into the newsroom and said, I think a plane just flew into one of the World Trade Center towers. And I and dozens of other reporters were very, very involved in that story. So even, uh, even if you are like me and you've had a column which takes you out of the daily run and takes you away from page one, you will still touch all of those stories uh, every time, every year. Bob, uh, I I work for the the Buffalo News, which was owned by Warren Buffett until you know a couple of years ago, and is now yes. owned by Lee Enterprises, yes. which is you know publicly traded and is fighting off uh, a hostile takeover. Um, you know, I. I I, 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 I'm not sure I, I'd agree that Wall Street isn't as involved. If anything, I worry that it's too involved. Um, I mean, you had the exceptions, but an awful lot of papers around the country are in the hands of uh, barbarians at the gate. Yeah, they're barbarians at the gate. But my point was that <clears throat> they're getting their money from venture capitalists and not from you and me, and not from oh, you yeah. and me over the counter in on the New York Stock Exchange. That's what yeah, that's true. It's it, it's hedge funds. It, it's yeah. it's uh, you know aggressive, nasty uh, hedge funds that want nothing nothing more than to uh, wreak every uh, every dollar and uh, cut journalism to the bone. Yeah, um, and the point that we just made about the Tribune yeah. <laughs> is being echoed at every newspaper. You know, it, this may sound strange to all of you for a writer to say this, but a newspaper without Don't have that here, is, you son of a bitch is really wow. nothing at all. You need editors. You need the entire integrity that's uh, supported by you. Mr. and Mrs. Ring, put the put the mute on, okay? I don't need you to hear your husband call your husband a son of a bitch. If you can't find the mute, then get off. That made for an interesting e morning. <laughs> well, it's not it's not unusual considering uh, the two personalities. Uh, anyway, uh, are there other questions? Uh, was that Elizabeth uh, with your hand up, or that's Daryl Daryl Temkin? Daryl Temkin. Well, no, it, it's Jerry Salzberg. But Daryl, go ahead. You go first. No, you go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. No, no, no. Age before beauty. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to argue with that on that one. Um, I got a question. Do you think Watergate has become can more morph into a footnote as compared to what's going on in Washington D.C. today? No, I think they'll the be country. they'll be equal in uh, in much the same way. Uh, although, I guess we could debate this. I think Watergate, uh, in some ways, uh, foreshadowed what's going on in Washington today and what has gone on in the four years before this administration. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, uh, but I think the idea that that the elasticity of the of the process can protect us all is uh, an issue that came up during Watergate, and it, it's coming up again. It's here every day. 
I, I have two questions. Yes, One, sir. what do you what do you think has been the um, the influence of uh, Jeff Bezos being the publisher of the Washington Post? Mm -hmm. And how did the Washington Post and the New York Times? How did they get this Russia Gate and all this other stuff? How did they get it so wrong? And as far as the editor, editor, editors are concerned, the New York Times is the same thing. I see some of the writing in the New York Times and I think I want to vomit. Well, let me be sure I understand. What do you mean by the Russia Gate coverage was wrong? Well, you know, just recently, uh, you know, Durham came out, you know, with uh, uh, indicted, uh, you know, uh, a, a Russian uh, Milanen or something like that and somebody else. And it seems all right, that the news reports that were being made about a year ago, two years ago, something like that, um, you know, they, they didn't do their homework. I mean, there was a lot more to the story uh, than what was published. Uh, they seemed to lionize uh, certain people that didn't deserve it. And there were other people that seemed to get lambasted. And as I recall, there's, there's an opinion writer with the Washington Post who basically said, you know something, I got it wrong. As opposed to the New York Times, okay, which is still being wishy-washy about it. Okay, well, <clears throat> let me take that one first. Uh, journalism is never perfect. It always gets certain things wrong because it hurries to market. Every mistake that I've ever made in a journalism career that's now more than 50 years old was caused by hurrying. It was caused by not making one more call or interviewing one more person. I'm not <clears throat> directly familiar with the Durham story on my own, but I want to be sure you're not confusing straight journalism with opinion journalism, because a lot of people confuse that. If you mean the straight reporting that was on page one of the Times, that can only be as thorough as a reporter can be in getting the information. If people don't want to give you information, then you cannot really do a full report. All you can do is a partial report. And we can argue about whether you should do anything at all if you don't have the whole story. And uh, I would tend to agree that you shouldn't. However, there are lots of commercial and political pressures on reporters now and on editors. And even if you have only two thirds of the story, if your nose tells you that it's accurate, you're gonna go with as much as you have. That is not the same as not doing your homework. It's the same as not being able to get deeply into the story because people won't talk to you. You also don't have subpoena powers. Remember that, uh, uh, Mr. Salzburg. Reporters are just Joe, Joe Glumpf. They call you and they ask you to tell them things. And if you tell them things, they'll publish those things. And if you don't tell them, they won't. So it's an imperfect business. I do think that on average, most of the coverage in the Times on the Russia question, if you go back all the way to the beginning of the Trump administration, when the issue was whether Russia had actually directly helped him become president, if you go back and look at those stories at that time, they were very thorough and very well developed and very accurate. Later, it got harder because the Trump administration would not cooperate with reporters at all, at all. <laughs> Remember this, the Trump administration had a press secretary who for nine months, she had the job for nine months, never held a press brief. I mean, that's something out of George Orwell, right? The press secretary does not cooperate with the press. So you got to balance it out. And I'm not trying to make excuses here. Mistakes do happen. Partial reporting does lead to errors. But I think on balance, that didn't happen with the Russia story. Now, your question on Bezos, uh, he's been a godsend to the Post. Uh, he has opened his checkbook. He has not trying to tried to intrude in any way on the editorial policy. He has not tried to dictate uh, certain approaches to certain stories. He's been wonderful. Uh, he, when he took over, the newsroom staff was 530 people. Today, it's more than 1,000. 
So everybody who thinks journalism is dead has not reckoned with this guy's checkbook. And granted, he's got a big checkbook, but he is spending it in the right ways. Let me just give you one example of that. Uh, you remember the story, what was it, three or four years ago when that guy in the hotel shot down at all those people at the country music concert in Las Vegas? 50 people killed. What a disaster. Under the Grahams, they would have sent two reporters there for a few days, and that would have been that. Bezos busted the budget. He chartered a plane. He sent 10 people there, reporters, editors, photographers, digital people, you name it. They just overwhelmed this story for a week. So he is willing to support the best journalism. Remarkably, too, and I think this may have been what you were trying to get at, he has not dictated editorial policy at all. He has not leaned on anybody in any way. And here's a little tidbit for you. When the Grahams sold the paper to Bezos, the other bidders at the final gun were a consortium of Hollywood producers, Spielberg and Katzenberg and somebody else. And they told Don Graham that the reason they wanted the post was so that they could have the big megaphone of the editorial page so that they could preach at Capitol Hill. And Don didn't want to do that. And Bezos promised him he would not do that, and he has not done that. He's been a, just an absolute dream of an owner so far. Are there any other questions, comments? Uh, I apologize for that uh, outburst a few minutes ago that uh, <laughs> that will not occur in the future. Okay. You know, I, I have a question. Marty Barron recently left as the executive editor. Yes. Um, and uh, I can't remember who they did. There was the editor at the LA Times who had been you know, a, a <clears throat> war horse in journalism. He left. And it seems that, you know, a number of these, you know, I hate to use the expression, these graybeards, okay, these guys who are really rooted in, uh, in print journalism, uh, they seem to be leaving. Now, obviously, you know, they're getting up in age and, you know, they want to retire. I get it. Um, but, you know, do you see that these, I mean, first things, I, I don't even know who the new editor of the Washington Post is. That's number one. Well, I'll be glad to tell you. And in fact, you're wrong because the new editor of the Los Angeles Times is a man who is in his late 50s who has never done anything but print journalism. The new editor at the Washington Post is a woman who uh, was the head of uh, all editorial stuff at the Associated Press. That is still mostly print. The editor of the New York Times has one more year to go until he reaches the mandatory retirement age of 65, but they will surely choose somebody who is steeped in print there. So you're not going to see what you've seen at BuzzFeed and, uh, and all the rest of these startups where they bring people in from the entertainment industry to run a pretty serious news operation. Uh, yeah, those the Marty Barons who were coming up close to 70 and uh, Norman Perlstein, who was well over 70. Uh, yeah, those guys have retired because it was time to retire, but it's still the news business. And for the foreseeable future, it always will be. Okay. Well, what do you, what, what's your thoughts about, I mean, I grew up outside of New York City. So I read the New York Post when the Schiff family owned it. Yeah. Now, of course, well, you know, what are your thoughts about this This sort of, I mean, is this journalism? Or? No, it's not journalism, but it's market-driven publishing. They, they call it journalism, but it's not quite the same thing. And uh, the New York Post was always attacked for much the same stuff. You know, the Post was never, the New York Post was never uh, the, the Bible of journalism that the Times and the Herald Tribune and even to some extent the Daily News were. It never tried to be. You know, the, the Post, uh, even then, even when you were a kid and I was a kid, was aiming at the subway rider, uh, was aiming through sports and, and entertainment right. journalism, uh, and was very thin on actual coverage of news. Well, today it's even thinner. 
but I will say this, uh, the New York Post is still my guilty pleasure, uh, Mr. Salzberg. Maybe it is for you. I love it. The headlines <laughs> no, I, in the New York Post are the greatest thing in the world. Uh, no, can, I just, no. can I just reminisce about one? Sure, of course. Of you course. remember when Tiger Woods uh, drove his car into that fire hydrant a few years ago in Florida, mm -hmm. and, and it was the beginning of the end for his marriage and all of that? The post headline on that story was, this is just so brilliant, Tiger, colon, I'm a cheetah, C-H-E-E-T-A-H, -E -E Tiger, I'm a cheetah. Somebody is really working hard to get that one. I love that one. Yeah. And of course, uh, the famous headline, uh, Ford to City Drop Dead, uh, that was in the New York Post too. So. Don't confuse it with the times. It's not trying to do the same thing. No, no, I understand that. I mean, Murdoch, I'm in Chicago and Murdoch came here and yeah. he bought the Sun Times. And needless to say, of course, it was a disaster. And Mike Royko, who was, you know, top, the top notch commentator, he left. He went to the Tribune. Yeah. So, I mean, and I've been to Australia and I've read a couple of his, you know, his, the Australian. Honestly, I wouldn't wipe my tuchus with the paper. <laughs> okay fair enough well i think bob in the interest of time we want to first of all thank you for your time and your insight and perspective on what is happening today in the world of uh, of reporting and journalism uh specifically uh in the united states and uh for your reminiscing about the uh watergate era hard to believe it's almost 50 years ago uh, for those still on the call, if uh, you have an interest in the, uh, the book that Bob has recently uh, written, and, and that's available, Larry Felder Candidate, uh, it's uh, available. And what is that uh, website again? Uh, BobLevyPublishing.com. And please note that it's L-E-V-E-Y, BobLevyPublishing.com. And as we used to say when I was a kid in New York, Operators are standing by. <laughs> You're looking at the operator. So uh, do stay in touch with us and let us know of future uh, book uh, initiatives uh, and publishing activities. And we hope to have you on again in the future. Happy to do it. And uh, thank you for your time and everyone on the call. Uh, best wishes for a happy, healthy uh, holiday season and a happy uh, 2022. Right. Thanks to thank all you. of you. Th thank you very much.